It is June the 1st, 2024. I'm Chris, and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. <clears throat> Good, whatever, morning, afternoon. Hi, Jeremiah, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. <laughs> I'm doing okay from uh, the other dimension known as California. Known as <laughs> Los Angeles. All right. Yeah, well, um, it's just the two of us today. And uh, we are, <laughs> we want to talk 3D again. Because why right. not? Because <clears throat> why? And, and I must say, it is kind of the future of photography. Um, it might not be coming quite as fast as we all hope it would with all the, the goggles and the, the virtual and augmented things. Um, but Apple has kind of kicked this off in the, in the developer space. Um, the WWDC is pretty close and while it has become a bit quiet around the Apple Vision Pro. Um, I'm pretty sure we're going to see a lot of, of that and maybe even an announcement for like a cheaper model that is a bit more accessible to, to yeah, mere mortals. Che che cheaper, lighter, faster, better. Coming that's soon, the hope I'm at sure. least. That's the hope um, at least. But, but, you know, with the software that's running it and the kind of notion of it, I think uh, the promise is good. I mean, my, my experience with 3D does go back. I mean, it goes I mean back. yeah, you've been, you've been doing ho holography and all the analog, weird analog stuff. For, for, for a long, long time. I mean, uh, almost as long as I've been a photographer, um, you know, my, my uh, first memory, of course, like everyone, was on the, um, you know... Uh, <laughs> the Viewmaster. Viewmasters. Yeah, um, I had those. I had those. And I think I was at some uh, jumble sale somewhere and bought a beautiful Bakelite box purpose built from Viewmaster limited edition that must have about two or three hundred of them and an old Bakelite Viewmaster two or three hundred discs yes and I wow have them. I, I still have them and they they are magical and weird and and, and crappy <laughs> and I think I felt good with having five maybe yeah. and half of them or at least uh, more than half of them with some disney stuff on them yeah exactly uh, you know and some of them are cartoons some of them are like faded ectochromes of paris and wow. you know it's all of that um and you know probably picked it up for like six dollars <laughs> at the sale and, and just kept it um the you know the interesting thing is you know that's when um when I, I did buy a 3D camera, I think it was the first one I bought was a Kodak twin lens. Mm -hmm. used 35 millimeter uh, film. It was uh, built extremely well. Um, you would use, I would use Kodachrome. And uh, at that time, Kodachrome had the um, option. When you sent your Kodachrome 3D, it would come back as mounted slides in a vertical um, format that you would use, that's the camera, um, in a viewer. And it was, you know, for those of us who remember Kodachrome, especially if you shot, say, Kodachrome 25, absolutely crisp, sharp, saturated, beautiful. Um, and if you composed it right and had your foreground, middle ground, and background, it would be astonishing. Really, really great. And um, I have those and the viewers still packed away and they are as good today as they, they were shot. And I shot a lot of kind of artsy things then. Mm. Um, you know, from then I got very interested in, you know, how would you work that with projection and manage to acquire, again, probably, it wasn't eBay, of course, but some used camera. So I could take those slides and this was a projector of 3D images, and people would wear polarized lenses at that time to view it on a screen. And uh, part of the gallery that I had um, been partner with, uh, you know, we would have kind of purpose-built uh, nights of projected arts and whatnot, and uh, would would project these. And this is going back to the um, probably the early 70s. <laughs> um, I mean, way back. 
Here, okay. Here's one. Here's a camera that I have in, in my, um, somewhere in a showcase, <laughs> a stereo realist. Ah, stereo realist. Yes. So know it well. Beautiful yeah. camera. And the lenses were really Built good. like a tank. <laughs> yes, built like a tank. All metal, very heavy, fabulous. Yeah. Um, from that point, I, you know, I got interested in um, holography, which was very new. You needed to do early holography. You needed a vibration-free table. Mm -hmm. You needed a powerful red laser. You needed a beam splitter. And you needed to coat your own emulsion. Uh, you had to make your own emulsion that coated a glass plate. And then you needed to put that glass plate uh, in front of the object you were going to photograph. And then light that object with a red laser and have the beam splitter split the light so that the light would be um, moved between the object and the um, plate. And we also had an ND, which we purpose built. Uh, it was a circular ND so that you would adjust the exposure or the amount of bounce from the object onto the plate so that you can control that. And that and that would that would then create an interference pattern that you could relight with a point light source and exactly kind of so bring when you back took to the, life. Yeah. When you when and this is all trial and error. Oh uh, yes. Wh when you when you um, uh, processed uh, developed the plate, then you could put it in the uh, holder, shine a beam onto it, and that object would be created in the background you'd look mm -hmm. through the plate to the object and it was as if it was there really really beautiful i talked to someone in uh, the south of germany in, in stuttgart um, and they had a lab in the middle of the city doing their uh, their holo holograms and the 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 the, um, the traffic was bad and made made it almost impossible for them to do it for the, for the vibrations. So they had to schedule it around the train schedule. Um, <laughs> yes, of course. And they also invested in a, I think like a five ton concrete slab under the whole setup. So sure. to decouple it from the vibrations of, uh, of the buses driving by. So Well, we, we had a stainless steel table about four inches thick. <laughs> That's heavy. <laughs> Very heavy put into our studio uh, it was very this is very very and a big maybe five foot long red laser which you really couldn't shine on your eyeball you would blind you yeah um and all of this uh courtesy of the canada council <laughs> we got an arts grant to do that oh. you know we were you know uh we had some credibility uh you know i have one of the artists working in 3d so we could you know we could say we were serious artists young as we were uh, working in 3d and we did get a, just a, a ton of money from them to build this and do this and some of the work was acquired um in the earliest art holograms were acquired by uh, the Museum of Holography, where we had a big show in New York, and uh, on and on and on. But that led to um, some of my more funkier explorations, uh, which was in anaglyphs. And I, I happen to be a big fan of anaglyphs because they I mean, are these. E they are easy to, very, very easy <laughs> to make. Uh, anaglyphs. The red, the red, blue glasses. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and they look phenomenal um, as a print. Um, they appear to be sort of black and whitey. Yeah. Um, but they're a lot of fun. You can do them at home. And we're going we're gonna to kind of step through some of the things you can do. On our um, TFOP uh, photo, shared photo album, yeah, uh, we are, I'm, I'm going to link those in the show notes, and just while you while you talk, I'm going to try to bring them up here. Yeah, so so those are there. Those are um, there um, to be enjoyed, but you need uh, those glasses either with like little cardboard holders or get yourself a pair of proper uh, red cyan glasses and um, have fun with it. Um, I of course 
<laughs> I of course made a few CG images of is of the one the, we're looking at right now here in the th video is that that's a CG? It. That is completely CG and 3D. But it's not AI. It is It's AI. Oh, it is even. And does yeah, it no, does it work? Let, let me check with my, my glasses. No, it works works stunningly beautiful. It is okay. So the AI is capable of doing Yes, that. except I didn't use AI to make the 3D effect. I created the image and ah, refined it, refined it, refined it. Then I converted it to AI. I used a series of images and <laughs> adjust, adjusted the left-right focal to okay, be okay. So you, on the eyes. <laughs> you, 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 you brought in some human magic to make this work. Well, and here's another one. Yes, sort of a, a Mandela spaceship. Yeah. Now, awesome. I've printed these about 1722, quite, you know, nice size prints. Um, very, very, you know, beautifully rendered. Uh, I think I used some bamboo, um, gloss, Hanamiel bamboo uh, gloss. And they, <laughs> the 3D effect is spectacular. I mean, it looks like these images are coming right out of the paper. Um, I've seen it exhibits anaglyph paper images that I think um, uh, German, Thomas Struth did one, I think. And they were they, they had to be like maybe 60 inches tall <clears throat> and they looked absolutely magnificent. So, you know, th there's a lot of fun to be had. Uh, it's still a great endeavor. You can print these at home and you can shoot these with your iPhone or whatever, but we'll we'll step through a few different ways to for people to participate. Here's yeah. a here's a video that you shared with us um, that's in the show notes. Someone explaining how to make that, how to do yeah. how to do that at home. And it's it's really worth looking at because uh, it's very very simple, and there's a lot of ways to do it that are very um, they don't require a lot of technology, and then there are some that are extremely sophisticated and all worth um, exploring. And they right. look great on the screen. They look great printed. And, um, you know, I don't think you can get your slides processed <laughs> to look through a 3D printer, but, um, you know, maybe in the future. Um, yep. Certainly, I've been exploring the ability to take a 3D photograph and move it effectively into the VR glasses, but um, I've not had total success yet, but will. Um, I think the real fun in that is building spectacular 3D environments, applying that into the VR glasses just for immersive um, experiences in kind of being inside art. Um, so this, how to create a 3D anaglyph photo effect is very, very good. And, uh, you know, I think they, they're they focused on GIMP, which is a open source uh, Photoshop. Um, but the, me the method will work in anything, in anything basically. Pretty anything. much that can do layers. I mean, it, it, the principle is you take a photograph that uh, is basically a left eye photo and then a right eye photo. And, and, then and if you have a not moving subject, you can literally take two photos and just move yes. the camera in between. Yes, you can just shift your weight that way and, and do it. And, and then with some of the software we'll go over quickly, you can adjust them so that there's less eye strain. Uh, here's one, you know. Um, I've used most of these and, um, you know, it's really um, user... <laughs> user just choose the one that fits right. with your workflow the, so, none of these are complicated so we're, we're going to share a few of these uh apps links to apps um this is 3d photo stereo image maker and then you had a i3d stero steroid yeah and they, they work very very nicely as well all right so these these are these are these are spe specifically made for iPhone. Uh, taking <clears throat> pictures on your iPhone and then making them into anaglyph stereograms. Yes, and and there's many different ways of, of shooting or, or composing. You you can shoot something called parallel, 
which if you remember the 18th century little viewing boxes, they held a yeah. carte de visite or something uh, quite small, two images. They fit in a little slot. You looked at it at a certain distance and that created a 3D effect. So people have been using uh, 3D uh, image making since the beginning of photography pretty well. This is Slashdot's kind of list of all manner of <laughs> 3D plenty images. plenty of them. Yeah. So, you know, if you're halfway interested in this, you can find a... Um, piece of software that is worth exploring and having fun, you know, with it. And I would um, argue this is the right time to to dip your toes in the 3D water because we are at the verge of a few big things happening in, in, in the way we consume media and 3D will be part of that. Yeah, I think gaming is going to be a major, certainly a major proponent of the 3D experience, Game, immersive gaming, 3D. Gaming has been one of the big drivers of, of tech innovation, and porn has been the other mm -hmm. one. So Yeah, and then following, you have training, <laughs> yeah. surgical training, mechanic training, where you can actually look into a jet engine and be guided exactly to what uh, areas to focus on um, that are a recreation of the reality um, microscopically. Um, surgeons are, are, are using them uh, to kind of operate in, you know, very, very, and robots are using it as well. Oh, because they're, surgeons were depending on the kind of um, surgery you get that might be a robot that a surgeon is uh, remote controlling using yeah. a 3d headset yeah yeah so so you have that that kind of immersiveness so it, it is something that is not just of the past um, I think in 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 terms of how do you, how to kind of uh, enjoy it there's a lot of different ways you can use you can experience it again parallel what they call parallel, which is two in images side by side in a viewer uh, at the right distance will give you that effect. Now, some people can kind of look at that image with a slight eye cross and bring those images together and see a parallel photograph in 3D, but <laughs> I find that too eye straining and weird. I, um, I, I could always do this quite well, to just relax your eyes and look yeah. through the screen. and um, But it's not for everyone. No. And then, the, the yeah, of course, the other one is is uh, what we've been talking about, anaglyph, uh, which is just separating left and right into two separate colors. Anaglyph Workshop is my personal favorite. I really like it. It's a very old school. It's not uh, it's know, on mobile. It's on a Mac and a, on a Windows. That's right. It's something that you would use after you've taken a left and right photo or you have a left and right photo, which you would like to separate and adjust. Because in stereo, if you've been... Um, if you've been to the movies and seen a 3D movie early on, uh, the parallax, which is the distance between left and right, can create eye strain, especially if you're focusing close and far and medium and whatnot, um, because the, the eye has to adjust not only focus, but in terms of turning in and out, and, and it creates a eye strain. Well, that now, in terms of the new technology of cinema 3D, which waxes and wanes in terms of popularity, uh, they've adjusted that so that, that even in the photography cinematically, um, you can adjust where the parallax, where the what the, we call the nodal point is for the kind mm -hmm. of perfect eye relaxation and effect. And I've I've had some experience in in that as well. But going back to how to experience it, there's lenticular, which is creating a. Um, I think. The viewers will be familiar with those kind of funny postcards that flip back and forth. They look a little animated, or sometimes in three D. They they might they yeah, might so. just when you when you flip when, when you when you um, rotate them slightly, they might show show you different kinds of pictures, or they might show each eye a different picture. That's it. And and uh, anaglyphs are really a beautiful way to do it. There's a few. There are companies that do it cheaply. There are companies that do it for fine art. And uh, in 2019, I I, I had an uh, exhibit of large 
lenticulars. You can even um, buy lenticular, like a foil with these uh, lenses built in and, and make your own? Uh, you you can. It's a very tricky bit of business. I would think um, so, yeah. The problem is that there used to be a lot of lens manufacturers with these very, very thin lenses, and you can create your print in Photoshop, which basically slices and dices the left and the right and puts them together, and these thin lenses fit over it. Um and, you know, without going into super weeds, um, it creates that illusion. But mounting it and adjusting it and getting lenses that are fine quality, which is increasingly a problem for the manufacturers, because now I think only China makes them. And um, the consistency of quality is not exactly perfect, so that um, the high quality manufacturers of lenticulars have to go through this process of like just looking at each sheet of lenses, eliminating some, because you don't want to be going through all that trouble and having flawed lenses, which take away the effect. So there's that. And um, so you have lenticulars, you have, an, uh, you have um, parallel, um, you, you know, and obviously the experience is a little bit different on each. Um, you know, in cinema, obviously you're using two lenses, um, on cameras or two cameras that are mounted on adjustable racks. And, um, uh, I had the opportunity of, of doing a kind of a test at Paramount with, um, with some of the more sophisticated, uh, cinema cameras that, that were, uh, built for 3D, but you need an army of <laughs> people to help set it up and, and be able to view it live. Um, so uh, uh, an effective movie is um, Martin Scorsese's uh, Hugo. Mm -hmm. um, it's a fantastic uh, 3D movie. Um, and uh, Dial M for Murder, Hitchcock's 3D movie. It, it, this is this. So was that shot in 3D or yeah. okay? Because shot because in 3D. we see a ton of conversions these days that were of movies that were shot in 2D and then they are. Yeah, that's different. Um, they are they are with with computer with computers with AI with other tools. They are converted into. 3D, yes. which is well, which is of, often often does look quite okay or quite well. Good. Speaking of which. Uh, that is the process uh, on which I built my little, um, you know, my, my you know, uh, AI-generated image, and then I converted it to 3D, <clears throat> something that Leapix does very, very effectively, and that'll be in the show notes, worth uh, exploring. Leapix, um, which is now converted to another... Uh, what, do we, what do we call Leopix nowadays? Immersity. AI. Immersity. Um, and that, that they used to just do slight adjustments to still photos so that they have a little appearance there. That's what their initial um, version is. But now you can take a, a 2D photograph and it will generate a depth map and you can output that depth map and you can output a... 3D version, and you can adjust the no. You can. There's a lot of adjustments to make that work, and that is in fact what I used for um, for my print. So that works very very well. Depth depth detection from a 2D picture that has yeah. come a long way. That used to be kind of the holy grail, but now with uh, the according yeah. tech, it seems simple enough. Yeah, I'm very impressed with with Immersity or mm. Leia. I, I think they've done an amazing job. And um, again, it's really fun to play with your own images, gives them a whole other feel. Even even the most boring snapshot all of a sudden takes on another di dimension. Um, we have a couple of little kind of interesting gear. Uh, you know, here's a, on the... Um, how do you how, how to do it with your iPhone stereoscopic 3D camera step by step guide? Um, yeah, there you go. There there's a there you know there's a bargain basement version of a parallel image, which which is instead of two uh, carte de visite 
uh, images and a viewer. This is basically the same principle with your uh, iPhone and um, a little plastic viewer, and there you go. Yeah, and they are um, cheap. You, they, you can get those for a few bucks. Yeah, and on the other side, if if that isn't you know, if you just have money burning a hole in your po in your pocket and, and want a little bit better quality, you can go for the Matterport Pro. <laughs> it's a bargain. It's only three thousand dollars. Come That's on, it. And, and you and you probably need some you know accessories for it as well. Um, and you know. Obviously, these are guys who build scanners and, you know, professional grade scanners, et cetera, for industrial work and very industrial high precision work. Industrial work and re real estate stuff and so on. High precision work. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, don't, don't, don't feel that you're constrained by spending a little money on something All right, that let, would work. Let me, let me throw one in, in here, which um, I just came across recently. There's this guy who um, talked about making art, 3D art with an iPhone. And uh, he delves into what you can do with the Face ID side of the iPhone, e.g. the selfie camera, which um, if you know the tech, it pretty much throws out a, a million dots in infrared and then uh, finds out how far they are away and uh, reconstructs a 3D image out of that. And there's a little app, um, I have no idea how to pronounce it, H-E-G-E-S, Hedges, Hegis, something like that, which is free and which supports the LiDAR camera. And it's a bit fiddly. Well, again, it's free, so <laughs> feel free to play with it. <laughs> but um, it allows you to take 3D scans of objects and turns them into actual 3D objects. And uh, not just that, you can then um, export them as 3D objects, as in OBG format or STL format and a couple more. So um, that way you have real, as in real 3D with um, in color. So I found this a very fun little toy to play with. If you have an iPhone and it's, I think starting with the iPhone 10 has the um, the face ID function, then you can use this tool and just play with also, it. Also something fun to do is get yourself some uh, red cyan glasses. They're cheap enough. Um, and, um, you know, just do a, a Google search of anaglyph images and yeah. you'd be really really um struck by how many are out there how many people are posting you get these glasses even in like a cardboard form they look like these uh um solar eclipse glasses but with the red and blue and those are like <laughs> penny pennies they are yeah. really really cheap yeah, they're, you know, at the exhibit I saw of uh, 3D anaglyphs, etc. Um, they just had a box of them for people to take, you know, yes. uh, and experience and throw them out. Um, and people are working in all kinds of formats. In fact, uh, this week I, I did see an amazing show at the Getty. We're very lucky here in California to have the Getty, which is an amazing miracle of photo research, etc. Well, they had a... Uh, an exhibit called 19th Century Photography Now. So they had all these old techniques, including 3D, running uh, beautiful, beautiful classic uh, imagery from the earliest uh, birth of photography up to now, but using those techniques. And then they had artists working in those old techniques parallel. And so you see that there is, there is a, a really interesting way of combining um, what it is um, you want to achieve using old and new technology, and that's really really fun. Um, I think the some of the best three D images that I've just played with are from the VR goggles, where you can actually capture something and then look at it again in 3D. And it, it does look absolutely like you're looking through the goggle and it looks absolutely flawlessly real. Um, so that's coming. Um, well, well, well. So, so 3D, 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 3D. Soon 4D. 
3D, yeah, 40. <laughs> okay, but but 3D. Let's let's start with uh, three dimensions. And again, I, we we do argue that that is an important part of the future of photography. Yeah, uh, I I would say so. Um, and you know, as much for what you were saying, you know, scientifically, analytically. Um, also interesting to do uh, an experiment if you are uh, shooting 3D landscapes uh, because it's infinity. It's very, very hard to take a 3D image of a kind of a wide, flat or, you know, distant mountain landscape. What you need to do is take a picture and then move, you know, a half a mile um, in parallel, take another picture and then combine it. And you'll get some very, very interesting effects very cool all right so we have we have put all these links in the show notes and uh everyone it's playtime playtime and so while here. you guys do hmm, you have something else no 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 Picture all right me. while you guys out there play with the tools um we have a couple of picks for you and the first one is directly related and it's a viewer or a camera or both yeah, this is a goofy little object. Um, what can I say? <laughs> it's self-explanatory. It, it looks a bit like a Viewmaster. Yeah. But it takes 3D photos. Yeah. And it's a, view, a viewer at the same time. So it's a really fun... That looks fun. It's fun, yeah. This uh, good stocking stuffer. Awesome. How much I is like that? It. I didn't catch the price. I can't get the price here because it doesn't ship to oh, Germany. Okay. So probably not super cheap. But looking fun. Awesome. Yeah. And it comes it comes with a 3D selfie stick. It yeah. does. <laughs> and of course you have one. Um, no, I don't. I oh, don't you don't. Yourself. Okay. I have I have I brought one that is sort of 3D related. Um do you know this picture? Yeah. It's the Windows 10 desktop background it's photo. It's a picture. It's a real photo. And uh, yeah, and it, it, shows, it shows the Windows logo and the blue light shining through it and so on. I just, I just found out that this is an actual photo. It's not 3D generated. It is a photography. They went into a studio. They played with like that's a real window you're seeing there or uh, four panes of glass then they used uh, smoke to get the volumetric light and then they uh, added light from the back uh, shining through that and you see that the edges um i think are that there's some laser projection built in that and they just spent an entire weekend in a in a studio um playing with smoke and light and a camera Shows you what you can do with old technology. Isn't that fun? <laughs> I mean, you you are probably gonna you, you've seen all that because um, you have been making movies and a lot of that stuff. I, I I bet a lot of the things that we see in movies that we think are um, come out of a computer are actually practical. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. We, you know, I think anyone working really prefers to do it in camera. You know, for a lot of reasons. I mean, part of it is that, you know, it goes to the editor and uh, you start to cut it right away instead of imagining what you see what is it's what you going get. to be in two or three or four or six months. Imagining and having to explain what you imagine to other people using words as opposed to just being able to show them. Am I right? Well, it, it's even it's even more um, more of a problem when you're when you're previewing a movie with a lot of special effects in front of an audience just to get a sense of it, and you have actors, characters moving in front of green screens, you know, with with the explanation that oh yeah, it's going to be a monster here, <laughs> you know, it. it if, yeah, and and someone and someone's holding up a broom ten, stick a with a ball. tennis ball at the end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not the same. It's definitely not the same. All right. Well, let me cue the outro music. Um, three D, three D. Try it. 3D. Some. <laughs> it's, it's, it's two, <laughs> two letters or one 
one one, one letter digit one, one letter <laughs> and uh that's all we need we it. and it's it's i find it really profound to we see the world in 3d and we don't even notice because that's how we see it every day but then when you see it on an artificial medium it jumps out at you so okay. There we go. You can, of course, find more uh, about us on the webs at thefuturephotography.com. Um, join our Discord. Link is in the show notes and on the screen. We'll be back pretty soon. Until then, everyone, take care and bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Thank you.